As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in the ancient city of Pergamum, standing in a passageway that goes under one of the major temples on the Acropolis. The city of Pergamum was filled with demonic powers, all kinds of dark, deep, mysterious religions, pagan religions. It was really a very oppressive place. And in the middle of this city, there was a man, a Christian believer, whose name was Antipas. And Antipas was casting out demons. And because he was casting out demons, he had created quite a ruckus in the city. Pagans were upset. The pagans were upset because they said the demons were upset. The demons were upset because Antipas was casting them out. He was exercising authority over demon spirits. And the pagans were so upset about what Antipas was doing that they went to the governor who resided here on the Acropolis, and they said, do something about this Christian that's casting out devils. So the governor summoned him for a trial. And when Antipas stood before the governor, early Christian records tell us the governor commanded him to repent of casting out demons and even told him that he was to return to his pagan roots. He refused to do so. And as a result, they butchered him. And the Bible refers to this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, where Jesus concretely describes Antipas, my faithful servant who was martyred. That word martyred is the Greek word apikteno. It doesn't mean just a martyr. It's really a word for carnage. It's the word for butchery. They butchered this man, and we know exactly what they did. Here on the Acropolis, there was a brazen bull. A brazen bull was a huge bull, like a statue. It was made of metal, and it was hollow. In its head, it had musical instruments. It had pipes. It had a door on the side. They could open the door, put a victim into it, then close the door and put a fire under the brazen bull. And this is what happened to Antipas. They put him in the brazen bull, closed the door, put a fire under the bull. The bull began to heat up. The metal got hot. And they literally fried Antipas to death. And as he screamed, his screams went through the musical instruments in the head. And it made it look like the bull was coming to life. And we even know that when the pagans did this to someone, when they were finished killing them, they opened the side door, extracted the bones, polished the bones, and wore them as jewelry. This is what happened to our brother Antipas here on the Acropolis of Pergamum. And Jesus refers to it in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, a man who stood true to his faith regardless of the price that he had to pay. And Jesus is calling you to stand true to your faith regardless of the price you have to pay. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. I've been waiting for you. In the introduction today, I told you that today we're going to be talking about Antipas. You say, who is Antipas? Well, that is a name that Jesus refers to in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, a man who was brutally horribly killed for his faith, but the Bible tells us about him and uses him as the example of what we are to be in terms of being a faithful witness in spite of what's going on around us. We're to be faithful all the way to the end. And today we're going to see the example of Antipas in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. But I want to remind you that if you need prayer, we're waiting to hear from you. We want to pray for you. Our team believes in prayer, and it is our joy to meet together daily, multiple times during the day, to pray for you and for everyone who contacts us. So we're here for you. And I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Pergamum. It's a 10-part series based on these programs with all the photos, the video, the points, the principles, the history. It just causes the Bible to come alive. I think Christ's message to Pergamum is one of the most important messages for us today. And the series comes with a study guide that is just, it's just amazing. When you see the study guide, I think you're going to say, wow, a lot of work went into this. It's going to be great for you personally. Be a super series to use if you're discipling someone or to share in a Bible study group. It's just tremendous. Also, we're offering you my book called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message 
to today's church. Many people use it as a coffee table book because it's so big and it's so beautiful. I doubt that you'll sit down and read it from cover to cover. Some do, but most people use it as a reference. And really, it is an amazing reference. It's full color, every page. It's filled with history. It's filled with the Greek, the Hebrew, everything that Jesus said to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. It's really amazing. And I want to read to you just a bit from page 140. Listen to this. According to Jesus' words in Revelation 2.13, that's what we're going to study today, Christians who lived in Pergamum at the time that John received the book of Revelation were immersed in an environment where Satan's kingdom thrived. That's true. I'm going to show you today. They were surrounded by a sea of rampant paganism that frothed all around them. As they sought to live for Christ, these believers faced continual confrontation with the powers of darkness. The courageous believers in Pergamum experienced non-stop skirmishes with the powers of darkness that resulted in bullying, persecution, prejudice, imprisonment, and even death. But they didn't give up. They didn't give in. They didn't give out. They remained faithful to the end, and you can too. It doesn't matter what environment you're in, the power of God in you can overcome the obstacles. And that's what we're going to see today in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. So we're going to jump right into it. Today, we're going to jump right to verse 13. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, Jesus is speaking to the church at Pergamum. And he says, I know thy works. We've seen this word know as the Greek word oida. It carries the idea of personal knowledge, firsthand knowledge. Jesus has been in this church just like he's been in your church. Jesus sees it all. And Jesus says, I know your works. That word works, the Greek word erga, it means all your deeds, all your activities. There's nothing about you that I do not know. Did you know that's true about you? There's nothing about you that Jesus hasn't seen and that he does not know. He knows it all. And then Jesus begins to tell the church at Pergamum what he specifically knows about them. What would Jesus say that he knows about you? Well, listen to what he says in Revelation 2, verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. That word dwellest is a Greek word, kat oikeo. The word kata means down. The word oikos is the Greek word for a house. But when you compound the two words together, it means to settle down like to settle down in a house. It pictures one who has settled down and feels at home. And the verb tense is continuous, which means there's no escaping it. This is their home. It's going to remain their home. They can't go somewhere else because they don't like their environment. This is where they're stuck. And by using this word, it is the equivalent of Jesus saying, this is an RIV translation of Revelation 2, verse 13. I know where you live. I understand it's your home. And I know what you have to deal with because of where you live. And likewise, Jesus knows where you live. Jesus knows about your family. He knows about your marriage. Jesus knows about your job. He knows about your health. He knows about everything you're facing in your life. Jesus knows it all. He can say to you, just like he said to those in Pergamum, I know where you live. I understand it's your home. I know what you have to deal with because of where you live. But what else did Jesus say? Jesus said, even where Satan's seed is. We saw in the previous program, the word Satan is the Greek word satanus. It's one who hates, accuses, slanders, or conspires against. Satan wasn't just haphazardly hoping to take them down. This word Satan means he was conspiring to take them down. And the Bible actually says, even where Satan's seat is, the word seat, as we saw in the last program, is the Greek word tronos. We covered it very quickly, so I want to cover it again today because it is so vital to this message. This word seat is the Greek word tronos, and maybe you hear another word. It's where we get the word for a throne. You could even translate this verse where Satan's throne is. But let me tell you how this word tronos was used in the first century when Jesus spoke these very words. The earliest use of this word described physical chairs in people's homes that were reserved solely for the head of a household. 
In ancient times, the man of the house held supreme authority over all domestic matters, and he had the final say-so in all decisions or business transactions that might affect his family. This was the man that had the final say-so. It was customary to refer to the head of the house as the Lord of his home. A seat was specially designated to represent the high rank of the man of the house within the family. It was considered inappropriate and disrespectful for anyone else to sit in that place of honor. It was a seat for the undisputed master of the house. That seat was a symbol of ultimate authority. And in the eastern lands of the Roman Empire, like in Pergamum, pagans used this word seat, the word tronas, to describe invisible seats of power in the spirit realm upon which the local patron gods or goddesses sat to rule their towns, their cities, or their provinces. And when Jesus says, I know where you live, even where Satan's seat is, even where Satan's throne is, Jesus is saying, wow, Satan has ruled there a long time. In fact, he has been uncontested in his rulership. No one has ever tried to resist him. He has been entrenched in that place in Pergamum until Pergamum has become his throne. And in Pergamum, until recently, until the gospel came, Satan was the indisputed master of the house with a final say-so in everything that would occur in the city of Pergamum. And not just Pergamum, but all of Asia because Pergamum was the capital of the province. And if Satan ruled Pergamum, it meant that he could rule the whole region. Or we find that Satan had very carefully located his power in the right place. He was very strategic. If he could dominate Pergamum, then he would dominate the whole region. And Paul says, and Jesus says, Satan has been the indisputed master of the house spiritually until the church came. Satan had the final say-so in all matters. But now that's changing because the gospel's being preached. Praise God. But in Pergamum, there was also a physical throne, and it was the great altar of Zeus. The altar of Zeus was huge. It was so huge, so ornate, so sophisticated, that even in ancient times, it was listed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Many scholars believe that this refers to the throne of Zeus, which early believers really referred to as the seat of Satan. It was like the symbol of Satan's power in Pergamum. And really, you couldn't live in Pergamum and not be aware of that seat because it sat 900 feet up on a ledge. It was gold gilded. It was magnificently carved. Smoke billowed into the air from its altar 24 hours a day. You couldn't live there without being aware of it. It was like a constant reminder of Satan's demonic grip on that city. And Jesus said to the believers, I know where you live. I know you can't escape. It's where you live. It's where you're going to continue to live. Even where Satan has had the final say so, where Satan has been the indisputed master of the house for a very long time. It makes me think of Ephesians 6 verse 12. And in Ephesians 6 verse 12, Paul says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. In a very real sense, the believers in Pergamum were dealing with spiritual principalities and they couldn't escape them because the whole city was filled with this activity. They lived with it all the time. A door had been opened so wide to the spirit realm in centuries past that Satan had come in like a flood and established a seat of authority in the city of Pergamum, but the light was now penetrating the darkness, and the gospel was beginning to unseat the master of the house. And that's what the gospel will do in your life. That's what the gospel will do in your family, in your finances, in your business, in your church, in your neighborhood. The gospel will unseat Satan. That's what the gospel does. And in fact, Satan was so threatened by the newly emerging church that Jesus says this in Revelation 2, verse 13. Even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Notice that Jesus says to the church of Pergamum, you holdest fast my name. Holdest fast 
is the Greek word kratos, but in this particular case, it means continually holding fast. The Greek word kratos, which is used here, describes a powerful grip. It means to seize, take hold of, to firmly grip, to apprehend. It tells us the believers in Pergamum were holding tightly to the name of Jesus. They were wrapping their hands around it, their faith around it tightly, so nobody could take it away from them. The fact that Jesus uses this word kratos, hold us fast, affirms that pressures of all sorts were trying to wrench the name of Jesus from their hands. Religious attacks, cultural attacks, social attacks, political attacks, all these were being levied against the Christians in the city. But those Christians made a decision just like you have to make a decision. They had made the firm, resolute decision that Kratos, they were going to hold tightly to the name of Jesus and not allow anybody to wrench it from their grip. Wow. These faithful believers latched hold of the name of Jesus. They made a decision to hold tight and retain their commitment to Christ regardless of any price they had to pay. But in spite of pressure to surrender, and there was a lot of pressure for them to surrender. There was a lot of pressure for them to modify their faith, to be more accommodating to the pagan worldview. But these Christians said, we're not doing it. We're not surrendering. We're going to hold tightly to what has been declared to us. We are going to retain our commitment to Christ. That was the decision they made. And Jesus commended them for this. And Jesus will commend you for doing it as well. And Jesus says, you've not denied my faith. Look at it in verse 13. You hold us fast my name and has not denied my faith. It means they have the ability or the opportunity to deny the faith. This word denied is the Greek word arneomai. The word arneomai means to disown, to deny, to reject, to refuse, or to renounce. Commonly, it referred to a person who became unfaithful in a relationship and subsequently disavowed, forsook, walked away from, and washed his hands clean of that other person. The motive for denial was usually fear of others, fear of suffering, ridicule, or persecution, or anxiety about others would think. And on the basis of those fears, people would disavow, they would break their commitments, they would walk away, wash their hands clean of, in order to protect themselves from some kind of emotional or physical injury. And actually, you could translate Revelation 2.13 like this. When you had the opportunity to break your vow and walk away, you did not do it. This church is amazing. Under all the pressure, they are refusing to let go of the name of Jesus. They're holding fast. And when they have opportunity to deny their faith or modify their faith to be more accommodating to pagans, they refuse to do it. They're not breaking their vow. They're not walking away. They're going to be faithful to the end. And in fact, the Bible says you've not denied my faith. That's what it says in verse 13. My faith is very important. The Greek says pistis Ten piston moi. Oh, that is so important. The word ten is a definite article. That's important. The word piston from the word pistis, which describes the faith. Moi personalizes it. It means me. It could literally be translated the faith of me. And it tells how deeply personal Jesus feels about the faith. First of all, it's not faith for miracles or just raw faith. He's talking about the faith. The Greek says ten piston with a definite article. The faith the creed we believe, the doctrines of the New Testament, those principles which are the foundation of Christianity. And Jesus calls it moi, it's mine. Listen to what it means. It conveys how deeply Jesus feels about the Christian faith. Jesus feels it very deeply. He calls it mine. It means my faith, the faith that belongs to me, this is what Jesus says, or the faith that I closely hold. This is very important because it tells us how dear the faith is to Jesus. Because of the word moi, which means of me, the phrase could literally be translated the faith of me. It shows origination and possession, which means the faith is from Christ and it is in the possession of Christ. 
The gospel not only comes from Christ, it is firmly still in his possession. He is the originator, he is the giver, and he is the supervisor of faith. Jesus died for the faith, and he calls it the faith of me. He understands they're giving their lives for the right thing. How about you? Are you modifying your faith to please others, to please the world around you? You don't have the right to modify the gospel. It doesn't belong to you. You have to reject it or stand by it. And the early believers made the decision to hold tightly to the name of Jesus, and they would not break their commitment to the faith. The pressure to modify faith has been around, you see, from the very beginning of the church age. This is nothing new, and there's still a pressure today to modify the faith to become more accommodating to a lost world. Don't do it. It's not your faith. You do not have the right to modify the faith. The faith did not originate with us, and we do not have the right to modify it in any way. But listen to this. It continues in Revelation 2, verse 13, and says, Even in those days were in Antipas, my faithful servant was martyred. Well, first of all, it says, in those days, in those days, in Greek is plural. And it indicates a long period of time in which persecution commenced. Antipas seemed to have been the beginning of that period of persecution. Now, who is Antipas? Well, we need to know who is Antipas. The name Antipas is a Greek compound word, the word anti, which means against, the word pas, which means all. When you compound the two words together, the name Antipas really means one who is against all. Now listen to this. It can describe a person, figuratively, who's against everything. The world thinks he's antisocial, contrary, non-compliant, intolerant, narrow-minded, a nonconformist, inflexible, obstinate, uncompromising, and some people say on the basis of this that Antipas was not a real figure, but this was just a figurative term that Jesus was using to describe the believers in Pergamum because according to the pagan view, they were all of those things. When people came to Christ as a consequence of their repentance, they broke all contact with their previous life. It was such a radical transformation as they separated from the godless world around them that unbelievers thought Christians were antisocial and against everything. Pagans harbored suspicion about Christians and believed that they were antisocial, contrary, incompliant, intolerant, narrow-minded, nonconformists, inflexible, obstinate, and uncompromising. Does it sound familiar? But there really was an early believer named Antipas. And we know what happened to him. Antipas was horribly killed on the Acropolis of Pergamum. It was horrible what they did to Antipas. And we're out of time, but when we come back tomorrow, we're going to continue to see what did they do to Antipas and what can we take from it to strengthen ourselves in the faith. Hold on to the name of Jesus, refuse to deny your faith, and do not modify the faith. Protect it, guard it, keep it, even if you have to give your life for it. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment. And I'm going to pray for you. Explore the Bible and the first century church with Rick Renner's book, No Room for Compromise. In this masterful hardback Bible study, Rick transports you to the first century and the life of the early church, exploring the relevance of Jesus' end time message to the church of Pergamum then, and how that end time message is relevant today. On every page, Rick reveals the larger context of the book of Revelation and his appearance to the Apostle John taking you on a journey through the first three centuries of Christian opposition within a pagan world. You'll be amazed to see how the early church thrived through the light, life, and power of Jesus Christ. This beautifully bound 400-page book can be yours for $80, features on-location photography, added artwork, and historical illustrations that enhance the in-depth teaching. When you call or go online today, you can also get the 10-part teaching series, Christ's Message to the Church in Pergamum. As one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the church in Pergamum was a light of faith in the pagan darkness. In this series, you'll see how Jesus' message of holding on to faith is just as relevant today as it was in the first century. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. Don't miss this special offer, No Room for Compromise. 
and Christ's message to the church in Pergamum. Call now or go to renner.org to order. I don't know what you're feeling. My name is Joel Renner. Right now. Coming to you maybe you feel Moscow the devil's Institute. trying to take your faith and away from you. I want to say you. thank you to all of our ministry Or maybe supporters. because of pressures because of family of your support, and friends or people who so do work, our work. You're a little tempted to modify your faith, to water it down, to become more compliant to those that are around you. Jesus said to the church of Pergamum, don't do that. In fact, he commended them because they held tightly to the name of Jesus and and they did not deny their faith. The Greek says, where we demonstrate the faith of me, Jesus is describing it as his faith. There are so many more that still need our help. So many more people battling hunger, poverty, mental illness, so many more orphans and children with special needs. Don't have the right to modify. Would you consider joining us we as part of today? It your gifts or can lift more people up really to society is forgotten. We can't do and this work without your financial support. Decision. When you give, we are able We're to take the gospel both to our nearby world Jesus and the ends We all have a part to play. Right from your home right now, you can help us help others by becoming our partner in the work by supporting our work financially. Please call or go online to win.org to give. With your support, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives. And Jesus wants you to be true to the Word of God. He wants you to stay on track when it comes to what you believe. So very important. I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Pergamum. You need to get this series. It is really good. It'll strengthen you. And we're also offering you my book called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. But I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the power of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to stay on track and not be led astray. We thank you that we can clutch to the name of Jesus and that name will work in our lives. We thank you for the faith that you have given to us and we ask you to help us guard it and protect it. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4? It says, where the word of a king is, There's power. And it's true. God's word will release its power in your life today if you'll embrace it and act on it. And that's what I'm praying for you. I'll see you in the next program. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.